In the previous lecture, uh, I defined what a, a determinant function is for a, for a general n by n matrix, and uh, we saw that the the determinant function for an n by n matrix can be computed as uh, the product of the pivots in the in the row echelon form, right? And we also saw that for a two by two matrix A, uh, d of A corresponds to the the conventional definition of the determinant of A. Right? So, so there, uh, when I did the derivation, you need to be a little bit careful because there is one case that I did not take into account. In particular, so, so here, when I did row reduction, I assume I implicitly assume that A11 is non-zero. Right? So, so in the case where A11 is equal to zero, then then this particular derivation does not work so uh, what do you need to do in that case uh, in that case you will need to do a row exchange right you need to exchange the first and the second rows and as soon as you do a row exchange you will recognize that it is already an upper triangular matrix and you can compute uh, what you get uh, in that particular case and you see that it's equal to minus a1 to a21 Right? And, and that still corresponds to the conventional definition of the determinant a, of A when A11 is equal to C. That's a special case. Uh, and But, but in, in getting a complete proof of this particular statement that D of A is equal to determinant of A, that case also needs to be taken into account. Okay. So this was what we saw in the previous lecture that, that using these three properties of n linearity alternating and d of i equal to 1, uh, we, we got a very general definition of a determinant function and, and at least for a 2 by 2 matrix, this corresponds to the, the conventional definition of uh, uh, the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix which you have seen in, your, uh, in, in high school or uh, undergraduate. So, so now what we are going to do is we will see what happens for a general n by n matrix. Uh, so, so we, we've seen that for a general n by n matrix, you can do row reduction, and 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 it turns out that uh, d of a is equal to the product of the pivots. But so so this so you should immediately come up with this particular question. So uh, is is d of a even well defined, right? Uh, because because what might happen is that look, you can take a general matrix A. Uh, and if you do row exchanges, if, I, if I, I can do an unnecessary row exchange and depending on how many row exchanges I make, I could get a different set of pivots, right? So for example, let's take the following matrix, say 1, 2, 3, 4, right? Uh, so I leave this to you as an exercise. Compute, so do the row reduction for this particular matrix, right? Uh, you will get something. Uh, now do the row reduction for this matrix. So, so basically you first do a row exchange and then do row reduction. So in this, so for this matrix over here, uh, you can take, uh, this, the, you can subtract the second row. So you can take the second row minus three times the first row, right? And uh, and the pivots that you will uh, and find out what pivots you get and for this matrix uh, you can take the second row the second you can subtract this from the second row you can subtract one third the first row right and you'll get the row echelon form so you so so basically the row echelon form of, of this particular matrix is, is not necessarily unique uh, because depending on whether I do a row exchange or not, I can get different pivots, right? So, even though the pivots can be different, uh, is it true that the product of the pivots is always the same? So, uh, I encourage you to take some examples, take some 2 by 2 and 3 by 3 matrices, do row reduction. So, uh, do row reduction uh, with and without row exchanges uh, previously. And and see you and, and you should see that you you get different pivots, 
but check that the product of the pivots irrespective of how many row exchanges you make the product of the pivots always remains the same right? so so obviously uh, and of course row exchanges could be necessary in certain cases so at least for these two uh, for this matrix 1 2 3 4 uh, to to bring it down to the row echelon form it doesn't necessarily need row exchange right uh, i could do it without a single row exchange uh, but but for d of a to be well defined uh, the product of the pivots must remain the same irrespective of whether i do row exchanges or not and in some matrices row exchanges are necessary so so here is one example 0 1 uh, 2 3 right so bring to bring this down to the row echelon form i need to first exchange the first and second rows and, and of course then immediately uh, this is brought down to the row echelon form right okay so So let's look at the determinant of a general n by n matrix right so so in resolving this question as to whether d of a is well defined or not we'll actually derive the the expression for the uh, a general expression for the determinant of an n by n matrix and to understand the determinant uh, it's it's very important to understand the notion of a permutation so what is a permutation a permutation is is basically a map it's a bijective map any bijective map from 1 2 3 up to n to itself right so it's a map which takes uh, an, uh, the set 1 2 3 up to n uh, to itself and any bijective map, any such bijective map is a permutation so one example so let's let's assume that n is equal to 3 uh, you could define sigma in the following way so you have 1 2 3 so sigma takes 1 to maybe 3, 2 to 2 and 3 to 1 right. So sigma of 1 is equal to 3, sigma of 2 is equal to 2 and sigma of 3 is equal to 1. So that is one example of a permutation matrix. So, so one example of a permutation uh, but here is another example. So you can take sigma which so, so this is permutation it's it's the identity permutation it's an identity map uh, but it is also a valid permutation 2 1 3 this is also a valid permutation so sigma of 1 is equal to 2 sigma of 2 equal to 1 and sigma of 3 equal to 3 so what is not a permutation this is not a permutation because this map is not bijective okay so any bijective function from uh, the first the set of uh, first n positive numbers to itself is a is a valid permutation so so here's a question for you what is the number of distinct permutations on n elements so how many pos how many distinct sigmas can you define on the set of n elements I want you to pause the video and think about it for a minute to come and come up with the answer. Okay, so hopefully you come up with the answer. The number of permutations is, is simply n factorial, right? Uh, and and why is that the case? Right. The reason is because now you want to find sigma of one, sigma of two, and so on. Right, up to sigma of n now how many ways are there to choose sigma of 1 uh, there are n ways there are n possible values that sigma of 1 can take now given that you assigned something to sigma of 1 how many possible ways can you assign sigma of 2 uh, there are n minus 1 ways right uh, because because 1 has already been selected so for, exa for example, if you have uh, n equal to 3, right, so there are n possible, there are 3 possible ways of selecting sigma of 1, 
maybe I select 2 right uh, now now given that sigma of 1 is equal to 2 how many ways can I select sigma of 2 I can only choose between 1 and 3 right I cannot take it I cannot take sigma of 2 equal to 2 because otherwise sigma would not be bijective so I can take 1 and how many ways are there to choose sigma of 3 there is only one possible value it has to be equal to 3 right so so similarly for general n there are n ways to choose sigma of 1 and given that you've chosen sigma of 1 there are n minus 1 possible ways of choosing sigma of 2 n minus 2 possible ways of choosing sigma of 3 and so on and there is only one way of choosing sigma of n so the total number of ways of choosing the function sigma is n into n minus 1 into n minus 2 all the way up to 1 and therefore the total number of distinct permutations on n elements is, is n factorial this is high school stuff okay so so that is fairly standard and something that you've seen but here's a here's a nice observation that to get any permutation so any permutation can be generated by pairwise exchanges so what do i mean by that so let's take this particular permutation sigma one two three four or let's take an even simpler example so for three elements let's say one two three i choose a sigma which is the following okay, two three one okay now i can generate this uh, i can obtain this sigma by two uh, pairwise exchanges of one two three so i can take the so one way to obtain to to get two three one would be to take one so you start with one two three right uh, i will exchange these two i will exchange one and three to get three two one okay and then i will exchange three and two to get two three one okay. so let's see a, let's see a more complicated a slightly more complicated example so so let me start with one two three four and i want to get three one four two which corresponds to one particular permutation right so i start with one two three four right uh, so what i first do is i exchange one and two to get two one three four uh, next what can i do i can exchange this and this to get three one two four and i can exchange this and this to get three one four two which is this right so so basically what i have done is that i have obtained this permutation uh, a general permutation sigma by a sequence of pairwise exchanges uh, in this particular case i need to make how many exchanges one two and three so three pairwise exchanges can generate this particular sigma right uh, so so the number of exchanges required to obtain a particular number of pairwise exchanges required to obtain a particular permutation is not unique because i could i could potentially obtain this in a in a different manner uh, so here is one particular example i start with one two three four now now let's suppose that i exchange uh say two and three first right so i get one three two four and then now i exchange let's say one and three to get three one two four and then i decide to exchange one and four to get three four two one and i exchange two and one to get three four one two and then i again exchange one and four to get three one four two right 
So the number of exchanges required here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 5 pairwise exchanges was, uh, was required to get sigma. So, there, so these are two distinct ways of getting the same sigma using different number of uh, pairwise exchanges. But, but one thing to note here uh, is that the number of exchanges required, the number of pairwise exchanges required in order to get this particular sigma is always odd. So here is 3 exchanges required, in this example 5 exchanges required and, and you can try different ways. No matter how you try, the number of pairwise exchanges that you require is always an odd number for this particular sigma. Right? So in general, uh, to get a particular sigma, uh, you, could, you could do different number of uh, pairwise exchanges, but for any general sigma, so irrespective of which sigma you choose, the number of pairwise exchanges that, that you need to do of 1, 2, 3, 4 is, all, is either always an odd number or always an even number. For this particular sigma, it is always an odd number. Maybe for a different sigma, it's always an even number. So, for example, uh, to get this particular sigma, uh, that one, two, three, uh, we, we saw one particular uh, case where, where you could get this using two pairwise exchanges. And, and I claim that you, you can try working it out for yourself, but you will always require an even number of pairwise exchanges of 1, 2, 3 to get 3, 1, 2. Right? Okay. So, so in general, we call a permutation, so given a general permutation sigma, this permutation is said to be odd if the number of such pairwise exchanges of 1, 1 up to n is always an odd number and if it is an always an even number then we call it an even permutation. So every permutation is either odd or even. So of course this is a statement that I am not proving over here because it requires uh, more deep results but, but you, can, you can take different examples and check it for yourself you will always see that a permutation is, is odd or even. So, so for example, uh, for this particular sigma, I cannot generate this sigma using an even number of pairwise exchanges and I cannot generate this particular sigma using an odd number of pairwise exchanges. So every uh, permutation matrix so every permutation, every such permutation can be represented by a permutation matrix. So in general, what is a permutation matrix? A permutation matrix is, is a matrix of zeros and ones such that every row has exactly a single one and every column has exactly a single one. And, and you can see that this, and this corresponds to a permutation because of the following reason. So so recall that a permutation is a bijective map. So let's take this particular example 1, 3, uh, 2, 1, uh, 3, 4, 4, 2, right. So sigma of 1. So, so, you, so corresponding to this particular permutation, I can construct a permutation matrix uh, such that the 1, 3 location is 1, 2, 1 location is 1. 3, 4 location is 1 and 4, 2 location is 1 and everything else is 0. So, so 1, 3 location is 1, 2, 1 location is 1, 3, 4 location is 1 and 4, 2 location is 1. So this corresponds to a permutation matrix because every row has a single one and every column has a single one. And it should be obvious that this should indeed be the case because as we defined a permutation, a permutation is a bijective function. So corresponding to every uh, 
uh, every element in the code domain there is a single element in the the pre image of every element in the code domain is unique and for every uh, element in the domain there is a single element in the code domain So this and, and correspondingly every permutation matrix, every such matrix such that every row has a single one and every column has a single one, such a matrix always corresponds to a permutation. So what permutation does this correspond to? I wanted to pause the video and compute it for yourself. Right. So this matrix corresponds to the following permutation. So the one one element is one. The second row, fourth column is 1, third row, third column is 1, and fourth row, second column is 1. Okay, so this is the, the permutation function that this, the bijective map that this corresponds to, that this particular permutation corresponds to. And, and again going by our discussion about generating a permutation using pairwise exchanges you can see that every permutation matrix can be obtained by a sequence of row exchanges right uh, so so this particular permutation matrix can be obtained by pair by row exchanges of the identity matrix so you start with the identity matrix you can do a sequence of row exchanges and arrive at this particular permutation matrix and as i as we did for for uh, bijective maps so the number of row exchanges that you need to do the number of row exchanges on the identity matrix that need to be done in order to get a particular permutation matrix is either always odd or always even right so for example uh, the, this matrix 1 0 0 1 can be obtained using either 0 row exchanges on i or 2 row exchanges on i. You can start with this. It is a, it's a dumb way to do it. But I can exchange rows twice. So 2 exchanges get this and this and I get back my original matrix. Right? So I can obtain this matrix by doing two row exchanges on the identity matrix right? and to get this particular matrix to get this particular matrix i need an odd number of row exchanges right? so so this so this particular permutation matrix is even and this particular permutation matrix is odd and, and why are we talking about all of this in the first place? It is because we want to find the determinant of a permutation matrix. Right? So, so we know that to so any permutation matrix can be obtained by a sequence of row exchanges of the identity matrix. And we know that the determinant of the identity matrix is equal to 1. Right? So therefore, the determinant of a permutation matrix is always is either plus 1 or minus 1 because you can obtain the permutation matrix using a, a finite number of row exchanges and depending on whether you need an odd number of row exchanges or an even number of row exchanges the determinant of a general permutation matrix is either plus 1 or minus 1 so 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 the determinant of p sigma is is 1 if it's an even permutation if an even number of row exchanges are required or it is minus 1 if if uh, if if an odd number of permutations are required if an odd number of row exchanges are required so given a general permutation sigma or or correspondingly a general permutation matrix p sigma we say that the sign of sigma is plus 1 if it is an even permutation and it is minus 1 if it is an odd permutation right so this is what we mean 
by the sine of sigma and I'll denote it as gn of sigma or sine of sigma. Right? So, so, so for any permutation on n elements, the sign of that particular permutation is plus 1 if it is an even uh, permutation and it is minus 1 if it is an odd permutation and this basically corresponds to the determinant of p sigma. So, so the sign of sigma is basically the determinant of p sigma right? and perhaps you have seen this formula for the determinant of an n by n matrix. Uh, so, the determinant of any general n by n matrix has the following formula. So, it is the sum over all possible permutations on n elements of, of this particular term. It is a sum of product terms where each product term is the sign of sigma times a subscript 1 sigma of 1, a subscript 2 sigma of 2, a subscript 3 sigma of 3 and so on uh, up to a subscript n sigma of n right so, so for a, for a 2 by 2 matrix there are only two possible permutations 1 2 1 2 so this is the identity permutation and 1 2 2 1 so this is the other permutation so so the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix is so the sign of the identity of permutation is plus 1. So it is plus A11 times A22 plus sign of this permutation. This is an odd permutation. So it is minus 1 times A12 times A21. So this is a11 a22 minus a12 a21 which you know is the determinant of a 2 by 2 meter. Okay. So this is a, a formula for the conventional determinant of an n a general n by n matrix and I leave it to you as an exercise to show that this definition of the determinant of a matrix satisfies the three properties of a determinant function. It is n linear. So, so, if you fix all the other rows, then it is a linear function of the ith row. It is an alternating function. So, doing a row exchange changes the sign of the determinant. And if two rows are identical, then the determinant is equal to 0. And of course, uh, the determinant of i is equal to 1. Right? So, that, so, I leave that to you as an exercise. Okay. So, so it is obvious that this is one way to define. So, so the determinant of A satisfies. So, this definition of the determinant of, of A so is, is corresponds to some D of A. It is a valid determinant function. But is this the only way to define? So, so uh, is there a different D of A which satisfies all the three properties, but it is not equal to this the conventional determinant of it. in fact it turns out that that's not the case so any function which satisfies those three properties is always equal to this particular definition so these two coincide is what so this is what we want to show so how do we prove this so so we, so we have to make use of those three properties uh, the n linearity and uh, alternating and d of i equal to 1. So, just using these three properties, we have to arrive at this particular formula, right. And the trick to do that uh, is, to, is to represent the matrix in a particularly nice form. What is this nice form? So, so let me define E i to be the ith standard basis vector. So, this is a vector it is a row vector uh, with all zeros except a 1 except the ith location which has a 1. So, all other locations you have a 0 except in the ith location where you have a 1. Right? And any vector uh, a can be written as 
so yeah, so any vector let's say ai so if i have a general matrix say i have a matrix v equal to v1 v2 up to vn i can write this as v1 times v1 plus v2 times v2 and so on up to vn times en right now this is a valid way i'm just expressing it in terms of the standard ordered basis okay so, so that's one particular way so now i can write the matrix a as in the following way it looks a bit complicated but i can write this as summation i1 going from 1 through n of a1 i1 e i1 right i'm just representing the first row uh, as as a sum of linear as a linear combination of the e i's i can represent the second row as e sum over all possible i2 going from 1 through n of a2 i2 e i2 and so on right so at this point i've done nothing i've just expressed each row as a, as a linear combination of these basis vectors okay so this is what i've done so so what is the next step the next step i'll use the n linearity property so if i keep all of the other rows fixed then then the determinant of a i claim is equal to the sum i going from 1 through n or i1 going from 1 through n of a 1 i1 times the determinant of e i1 and the remaining rows that is a2 a3 up to an right and this simply follows from the n linearity property now what do i do i'll use this i'll use the n linearity property repeatedly so so basically i'll do this on the second row and then the third row and then the fourth row and so on right so basically what I would get would be the following. So the determinant of A would be equal to sum over all possible I1, sum over all possible I2, sum over all possible I3, so on, sum over all possible In of A1 I1 times A1 I2 and so on times A1 n all within the brackets yes. okay. so this times the determinant of this particular matrix e i1 e i2 e i3 and so on up to e i n So what have I done? I've just expressed A in terms of the basis vectors, the EI basis vectors, and then using and, and repeatedly using the n linearity property, I've written down the determinant of A as a, a nested summation over I1, I2, I3 up to I n of A1 I1, A1 I2 up to A1 I n times the determinant of this particular matrix. So, so as long as I can, I know what the determinant of this particular matrix is, I'm done. But what is the determinant of this particular matrix? If for if if i1 is equal to i2 or i1 equal to i3 or, or if or if any of these or if any two rows of this matrix are identical, then the determinant is equal to zero, right? 
so so what do, what does this matrix look like uh, this matrix over here is basically a zero one matrix right so basically in each row you have a single one so this is zero 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 one zero 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 uh, maybe one zero 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 but you could also possibly have a repeated row okay, so this is one particular uh, example right uh, but in this in this particular example i have written uh, the the second row and the fourth row are identical right so depending on what i1 i2 i3 up to i n r uh, this corresponds to a zero one matrix with exactly a single one in in uh, in one possible in each possible row and how many possible ways how many possible such matrices are there how many uh, how many terms do you have in this uh, nested summation there are n square possible terms in this sorry uh, there are n power n possible terms in this particular summation because there are n ways to choose the first row n ways to put a one in the first row n ways to put a one in the second row and so on so n times n times n times n times n so there are n to the power n possible ways of n power n terms in this particular summation but we know that if any two rows are identical then the determinant is equal to zero so we can throw all of all such terms out so which terms remain so the determinant is non-zero only if this matrix is a permutation matrix right pause the video and think about this for a while that this particular determinant this quantity over here is non-zero if and only if the matrix is a permutation matrix this particular matrix is a permutation matrix right and we know what the de what the determinant of a permutation matrix is already it's either plus 1 or minus 1 so basically instead of summing over all possible i1 i2 i3 up to in i can write this as the sum over all possible permutation matrices sigma of a1 sigma of 1 a2 sigma of 2 and so on up to a n sigma of n times the determinant of the permutation matrix which is basically the sign of c right? and so we've we've derived the general formula of the determinant of an n by n matrix just using those three properties okay so now that we've seen that the definition of a determinant is, is, is unique there's no inconsistency uh, this also means that irrespective of how many row exchanges you do uh, so so note that to get this so we only use these three properties and any function which satisfies these three properties must be equal to this right so this means that irrespective of how many row exchanges you do during uh, row reduction uh, so no matter even if the pivots are different in the in the row echelon form the product of the pivots always remains the same always equal to the determinant of the matrix and in fact this property is sometimes used to uh, a, uh, by many software packages for example matlab uh, when they do row reduction uh, even if the matrix is full rank sometimes they do some row exchanges just to avoid numerical issues so for example if you wanted to do row reduction on this particular matrix they tend to the minus 10 1 5 2 right so so to obtain so so maybe you want to find the inverse of this matrix or you want to do in general you want to do row reduction 
you don't do you could potentially divide the second so you could subtract uh, say 5 divided by 10 to the minus 10 of the first row from the second uh, uh, from the second row but then this would lead to a lot of numerical problems so it is it is much more helpful to first do a row exchange bring it down to pi 2 10 to the minus 10 1 and then do row reduction because uh, uh, because because then you don't have to divide by a very small number right uh, it becomes it becomes much more easier <clears throat> and a lot of floating point uh, so, so so you don't run into issues of finite precision okay so now that we've seen uh, a formula for the determinant of a matrix and uh, uh, and, and how how the how the how any determinant function is equal to the conventional determinant let's now see why the determinant of a or the absolute value of the determinant of a is equal to the value is equal to the volume of the corresponding parallelepiped So to understand this, let's let's first check. So what is the area of a parallelogram equal to? Uh, so given any general parallelogram, the area of the parallelogram is is equal to the base, the length of the base into the height. Is equal to. So so if you think in terms of linear algebra, what we are doing is. We are writing so so this can be so the parallelogram can be represented in terms of two vectors p1 and p2 right well decomposing v1 into two components uh, one which is which is a component along v2 so this let's call, let me call this v1 parallel and Another component which is orthogonal to V2, let me call this V1 perpendicular and, and basically the area is equal to the length of V2 times the length of V1 perp, right. So it is the base times the height. The height is simply given by the length of V1 perp, okay. So what about a three dimensional parallelepiped? So in general for a three dimensional parallelepiped uh, the volume is equal to the area of the base times the height of the parallelepiped uh, and, and, and basically once again what are we doing so we have the parallelepiped represented by three vectors three adjacent vectors let me denote them in green so basically I am taking the area of the base and then times the height but what is the height equal to? The height is equal to the length of the orthogonal component along, along this along the subspace span by these, these two vectors. Right? So I can decompose I can decompose this particular green vector. So let me denote this in yellow maybe. So I can decompose this particular yellow vector into two components, one along the subspace spanned by the green vectors, and another which is orthogonal to the subspace spanned by these green vectors, and the length of this particular vector over here gives the height right and this can be generalized to n dimensions so so if you have a, a parallelepiped in general an n dimensional parallelepiped then it is equal then you can recursively obtain the volume of the parallelepiped as the as as the volume of one face times the height which is the length of 
of of of one vector along which is orthogonal to the face right and, and so so basically what are we doing so suppose that the parallelepiped is defined in terms of the vectors v1 v2 up to vn and i can stack all of these as row vectors in a matrix a then i can write v1 uh, so so i can obtain the area of of this particular face okay so for a three dimensional case i can, so the volume of the parallelepiped is the height times the area of the base but the base is itself a parallelogram so the base so the area of the base can be obtained as the length of the base of the two dimensional parallelogram times the height and so on right so for a four dimensional parallelepiped you can write it as a height times the volume of one particular face if you will and which is a three dimensional parallelepiped and the volume of that of the of the base parallelepiped can be obtained by uh, is is basic so it's a three dimensional parallelepiped so it's a height times the area of one particular face the base face and and the area of the face is equal to the base times the height because it's a two dimensional parallelogram so you can recursively uh, decompose a parallelepiped and n dimensional parallelepiped as one vector uh, as an orthogonal vector times uh, an orthogonal vector and uh, and a set which is in n minus 1 dimensions and the n minus 1 dimensional face can be again decomposed as an orthogonal vector and uh, an n minus 2 dimensional face and so on so you can do this in a re in a recursive fashion so basically what you're doing is you're taking a, a matrix a you're taking this particular matrix a and you start with the first vector v1 which is the uh, which is the base and then you can look at the second vector and i can decompose the second vector along two directions one which is uh, orthogonal to the vector and the other which is along the direction of the so v, v2 is can be written as v2 parallel plus v2 perp right so if i retain but, but what is v2 perp equal to so v2 perp is simply equal to v2 minus the component along v1 v1 right uh, but 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 what is this particular and similarly i can write uh, v3 as in terms of components along v1 v2 and a component which is orthogonal to v2 and and basically if i retain only the components the orthogonal components at each step then this i would get v3 minus the component so if i call this v2 prime then it is a component along v2 prime minus the component along v1 right and similarly v4 can be written uh, as v4 minus uh, a component along v1 minus a component along v2 prime and the component along v3 prime and so on right so so basically what am i doing here you, this this is uh, these are of course these are row operations these can be obtained via row operations but but more importantly these vectors are, are things that you, or this this the sequence of operations is something that you've already encountered this is basically gram schmidt orthogonalization right except that we are not normalizing the vectors at each step so if you don't normalize the vectors at each step then then basically this this is this is the same as gram schmidt orthogonal orthogonalization we're only retaining the orthogonal components at each step right and 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 basically uh, what is so, so so all of these are orthogonal vectors and and the lengths or and 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 basically the the volume of the parallelepiped is is the length or is the product of the lengths of these orthogonal vectors 
and therefore uh, the determinant of a prime so you can do do, do this as a prime a double prime and so on and and ultimately you will, you will be able to show that the volume of of the parallelepiped is equal to the determinant of a because because at every step you are doing a row operation and and for a, and every time you do a particular row operation uh, the determinant does not change right so each each such row operation does not change the value of the determinant but you might need some row exchanges in between and and that is the reason why 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 you might get a negative sign so so the volume of the parallel pipette is equal to the absolute value of the determinant of the matrix and clearly if 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 two uh, if two of the vectors which determine the parallel pipette are uh, are linearly dependent so if one vector is linearly dependent on the others then you don't get an n, n dimensional object anymore it collapses to n minus 1 dimensions and therefore the volume is equal to zero and correspondingly the determinant of the matrix is also equal to zero because a is not full rank okay so so to summarize we saw uh, we, we started off with uh, a general definition a very abstract definition of uh, a determinant function as a function which satisfied three properties and then we saw how it uh, and then we derived explicit formulas for the determinant of a matrix and then we saw that all of this is is basically connected to the volume of of a parallel pipette so so that is what what all of this uh, geometrically means